In this video, we're going to talk about derivatives of fields and the gradient operator. As a preview of what we will discuss, we will first review the properties of the derivative of a one-dimensional scalar function, followed by the same thing but for a function of two variables. This will lead us to the introduction of the so-called gradient operator. So let's begin with something familiar, a simple scalar function f which depends on only one variable x. Let's let x represent something familiar, such as distance, and f also represents something familiar, such as elevation above some reference point. So f is a field that depends on a spatial variable x. Now, if we were going to look at some closer properties of this field, for example, by traversing it, if we were walking along this field of elevation, we would see that depending on where we are, we experience a different slope. For example, if we're walking from left to right, the slope here is lower than as we get closer to the top. And similarly, on the uh, falling edge of this hillside, if we're over here, the slope is in the other direction and quite steep. So we know how to represent this type of information. We do this through the derivative of f with respect to x, which we can plot here. So we can see that because of the structure of this hill, that very, very far away from the hill at the endpoints here, uh, it's essentially flat, which means that the derivative is zero or close to zero. But as we encounter the hill and we traverse from left to right, we can see that the slope increases and becomes positive in this region. And it continues to increase, actually. It's very, very steep over here. And if we correspond and project down, we can see that this is actually a maximum slope point. This is the steepest section of this hillside, at least on the left side of that hill ascending from the left. There's also a point of inflection. At the very, very top, the slope is zero. We know that because if we drew a tangent line there, the slope is zero. And that actually corresponds to this zero crossing here in the derivative plot. Beyond that point, the derivative actually assumes a negative value because obviously we are descending the mountain and we can see that the value of the derivative is actually quite large, larger than what we would encounter when we ascended the hill from the left, just because it is steeper on the right-hand side. So we can very quickly ascertain the structure of this field by looking at its derivative, some physical interpretation there. Um, it's also easy for us to separate this derivative into a part where we are clearly climbing and another part where we are descending, depending on the slope or the sign of df by dx. So in the climbing region, the derivative of f with respect to x is positive, and in the descending side, the derivative is negative, and it's zero right at the boundary. Okay, so how do we extend to two dimensions here? So here's a two-dimensional plot of a field f, but this time the field depends on two variables, x and y. Those can also still represent distances, and f can still represent elevation. And now we're able to trace out something that actually looks much more like a hill because we have uh, x and y coordinates to, to draw the picture with. The question is, how do we determine the derivative of this function? That's not clear. We know the derivative depends on space, but if I choose some random point on this hill, it's not clear what the derivative is there because how do we measure the slope? Do we measure the slope in this direction? Do we measure the slope in this direction, in this direction? What do we do? That's the same thing as asking, do I take the derivative of f with respect to x? Do I take the derivative of f with respect to y? How do we define the derivative of f now given this uncertainty? And notice that we have to use a partial derivative sign now because f depends on more than one variable. To aid in this discussion, we can use something called a contour plot. So here's the same plot of the field F, but I'm going to change it now and uh, plot these little contours or lines on them. And these are called level curves because each of these lines represents a value of F that is constant. So for example, this might represent F equals 600 meters. And everywhere along that line, F is constant. It's called a level curve and assumes a value of 600 meters. I could choose the next contour up, and maybe this represents f equals 625 meters. The spacing is arbitrary. We can choose whatever we want just to make it look uh, clear when we plot the graph. 
If we view this function from the top, we get this contour plot, uh, two-dimensional contour plot. And to aid here, we attach labels to the contours so we know what value the level curve is assuming. So here is that 600 meter curve. Everywhere along this contour, the elevation or value of f is 600 meters. And uh, we can plot other curves. There's an 800 meter curve, a thousand meter curve. Here, the level curves are spaced by 200 meters. That's arbitrary. We do that just to make it easy to plot or more clear to plot. So this is very useful when we start to think about taking a derivative because um, let's say we are trying to find a derivative at, at some point, let's say here. The, the ambiguity of the derivative is, is equally as clear as what we discussed before. If I took the derivative in this direction, obviously I'm not changing the value of f at all, so we'd expect the derivative to be zero. But if I take the derivative in this direction, then I'm starting to cross other contours. Clearly, f is changing, and f is changing quite quickly because these contours are spaced very, very close together. Whereas over here, the contours are not spaced as closely, and we might intuit that this function is changing less steeply in that section. So this brings into mind the idea of a um, directional derivative. You may have seen contour plots before. This is an example of a topographical map of the Rocky Mountains in Western Canada. And uh, these again are curves of constant elevation. And so if I was planning a mountain trip through the Rockies, um, if I'm in this region, I'm clearly crossing contours very, very frequently. So it's very steep and the elevation changes are very rapid in this region, but near the basin of this mountain, the elevation changes are, are uh, much less frequent. And so we would um, determine that it's uh, uh, much less steep in that section. If we're trying to even pass through Wonder Pass here, this is seemingly where the contours are most spaced out, given that we still have to cross over a mountain. So returning to our contour plot of F, we can now compute a spatial derivative, and we should make a few observations. First, we did note that the derivative should be a function of both x and y. Anywhere we are on this plot, there should be a different value of the derivative. And at each point where we evaluate the derivative, not only do we need to specify the slope, we need to specify its direction, as indicated earlier. Depending on which way I look, the slope is different. Therefore, we can conclude that when we take the spatial derivative of a scalar function, f, the output is actually a vector because it has direction associated with it. And this operation is called gradient. We represent the gradient operation with this upside down delta sign, which is called nabla. And here we're taking the gradient of f, two-dimensional function, and we can see that it has two components. Being a two-dimensional function, it has two vector components x and y. The x component only depends on the partial derivative of f with respect to x, and the y component only depends on the partial derivative of f with respect to y. So now we can compute these uh, functions and plot the resulting vectors. So here's our contour plot from before. If I carry out this calculation, here are the vectors superimposed on top. Remember that vectors convey both magnitude and direction. The magnitude of the vector is indicated by the length of the vector. So a long arrow here is a very strong vector, large vector. And the direction is obviously uh, given by the direction of the arrow. And, sh and short arrows obviously represent a very small value of the derivative. So we can see that there is a region, for example here, where these arrows are quite large or long indicating that this is a very steep part of the mountain. And we know that to be true because the contours are very, very close together there. And correspondingly over here, these arrows are very, very small because the contours are far apart. This is a very flat part of our landscape that we plotted earlier. We can interpret the gradient a few different ways. We could take, take the length of the vector and actually plot that on a plot. So this is a scalar because we're taking the length of gradient of F and um, the color bar on the right shows just the value of the derivative. So yellow is a very large value of the derivative, and blue is a very small derivative. And again, we see the steepest part of the mountain where this function is most yellow. 
Remember that uh, gradient has direction associated with it. So if I do something like take the negative of gradient, that's just going to reverse the direction of the arrows. And that leads to a plot that looks like this. So this looks just like what we had before, but the direction of the arrows has been turned around. This is useful because if I'm trying to, let's say, ascend the mountain, so if I go back here, if I'm ascending this mountain and I don't want to exert myself too much, I should choose the path where the elevation changes are rather subtle. So I might choose a path to the top of the mountain this way. This is a very gradual ascent of the mountain that would be least exerting compared to if I ascended the mountain, let's say, from this direction. That might be, I might be taking a lot of breaks to ascend the mountain from that side because it's very steep. I could make it a bit easier for myself by zigzagging up the mountain using switchbacks. Conversely, if I want to descend the mountain, let's say I've got a pair of skis with me or a snowboard, well, to make it more fun, I'd actually want to choose the direction of most descent. And so I may want to go down this way or this way or this way. It would be least interesting for me to go down the way I came because the slope is smallest there. That brings us to a nice analogy of skiing. Here we can see the, uh, the slope quite evidently in this photograph. So the skier, if he wants to go fastest, would go down the mountain, and this would be the negative gradient of f, which points in the direction of maximum change. And correspondingly, if we plotted level curves here, those level curves, points of constant elevation, would actually be normal to the gradient of f or the negative gradient of f. So for example, this might be 600 meters in elevation here, and this might be 595 meters here of constant elevation. So this concludes this video of the short description of the gradient operator.